Hello everyone, good afternoon. Lovely to see people introducing themselves from all different parts of the country and actually all different parts of the world. We're so pleased that you are here with us today. It's two o'clock on the dot now, so I think we should get underway. For those of you who I've not yet had the chance to meet, my name is Claire Wood. I'm a lecturer at the University of Leicester, a lover of pretty much all things Dickens, and the principal investigator of the Dickens Code project. And my name is Hugo Bowles, and I'm professor of English at the University of Foggia in Italy and international co-investigator on the Dickens Code project. I'm an applied linguist rather than a Dickens expert, but I've been researching Dickens' shorthand for quite a few years now, and I'm really pleased to be working with Claire on the Dickens Code and opening it up to the public in our symposium today. And do keep introducing yourselves in the chat as Hugo and I just take a, you through some introductory points. I've got a few housekeeping things first, of course. This is a Zoom webinar, and what that means is that only our speakers are appearing on video. So if you're attending as a participant, you don't need to worry, you're not on screen. We are, however, really keen for you to be involved in other ways throughout the day by using the Q&A feature to ask questions, responding with your thoughts in the chat, and if you're on Twitter, following along with us there. The papers today are being recorded and we'll make these available next week. I should also say we'll be saving the chat at the end of the symposium, so please bear that in mind when you're making your contributions. We have a sticky slide here, I think. There we go. Welcome, everybody. Sorry about that. There was a problem with the slide. Um, I just wanted to say to all of you um, a very warm welcome. Um, it's lovely to have you here. And I just wanted to make a quick comment about the people who are here, our participants. We've got people from India, Canada, France, United States, as you can see on the slide, Italy, Iran, Netherlands, Ireland, South Africa, Belgium, Turkey, Germany and Japan. So wherever you are, um, uh, a welcome to you all. One very important thing about our project, which we want to, um, we want to stress today, is that this is not um, a specialist project. It's um, not necessarily for academics, although we do have obviously uh, academics with us. It's for people from all walks of life, computer engineers, puzzlers, gamers. Uh, we've got digital humanists and librarians. We've got students, postdocs, um, lots and lots of school teachers. So this variety is extremely important to us and um, we hope that it continues. Public support is absolutely key uh, to the success of the project because the only way we'll be able to understand Dickens' shorthand is if as many people as possible put their heads together to puzzle it out. So that's why we're really pleased to see that the people are just, you know, from, from all, all walks of life. Um, you don't have to be an expert to get involved in the Dickens Code. You just have to like mysteries and puzzles like we do. And today is all about explaining what our particular Dickensian mysteries and puzzles are. So we hope that you're going to enjoy today. And if you have any friends or colleagues who you think might be interested, please spread the word and let them know about us. Okay, back to Claire. Thanks, Hugo. So at this point, I thought it would be helpful to introduce you to what the Dickens Code project, of which this event is a part, is all about. The Dickens Code is an AHRC funded initiative which aims to raise public awareness of Dickens' shorthand writing and to enhance academic knowledge of how Dickens used shorthand. Phase one of the project started in March this year and it will run through to February 2022. But what are we actually doing? First and foremost, we're building a network. This includes researchers from a range of fields, including Dickens Studies, Digital Humanities, Forensic Linguistics and Informatics, whose different disciplinary viewpoints will enable us to approach the challenges of Dickens' shorthand in the round. We're also building a public network of would-be decoders, as Hugo has highlighted, keen to join us in solving these shorthand mysteries. 
One thing that we don't want to do is to reinvent the wheel. We know how much innovative work is taking place in this space already, and we want to learn from it and build upon it. Our second session today is dedicated to this goal by showcasing a range of inspiring projects, past and present. Phase one also centers on the three Ds, digitizing and contextualizing Dickens's shorthand material via an online exhibition, developing decoding skills through trial workshops and disseminating our findings along the way. You can find out more about the project and our partners on our website. The link is on the slides. But now I think we should see what we've got in store for you today. We've deliberately kept the papers short to no more than 10 minutes to leave you asking for more rather than overwhelming you with content. Our first session is all about contexts, starting with an introduction to shorthand from the 17th century through to the 19th. Hugo will also be giving the answers to the pre-symposium task, so stay tuned if you've been scratching your head over those mysterious characters. Then at 3pm, I'm really delighted to be welcoming curators from the UK, Germany and the US who are going to share a piece of shorthand from their collections. If the tech holds up and pray for me, we're even going to have the chance to meet Dickens's Raven Grip live from the Free Library of Philadelphia. After a quick break, we're back for session two at 3.45, focusing on a terrific range of digital humanities and crowdsourcing projects across two different panels. Then, in our final session, starting at 5.35, we'll find out more about what different disciplinary approaches can bring to deciphering Dickens' shorthand, with perspectives from informatics and forensic linguistics. Now, at the start, I said how keen we were to get you involved. As well as opportunities for Q&A, you might notice that we've dubbed the breaks slightly curiously, coffee and comment breaks. And this is because we plan to pose a question to you at these times, such as what can we do to bring shorthand to life online? Your responses will feed into how we develop this project in the future. At the start of the following session, the inimitable Pete Orford, lecturer in English literature at the University of Buckingham, will spend five minutes recapping what we've covered and reflecting upon what has emerged from your comments. We'll also be hearing from the brilliant Lydia Craig, who recently finished her PhD in 19th century studies at Loyola University, Chicago, and she's generously agreed to live tweet the event. So please do follow along at Dickens underscore code. Our conference hashtag, if you're tweeting yourself, is hashtag decoding Dickens. Now back to Hugo, who'll tell us why you should be sticking around until the very end. Yes, please stick around. Don't go and watch the Olympics. Our opening <laughs> ceremony. Our opening ceremony is miles better. Um, now we are very fortunate uh, to have an anonymous donor who has offered a £300 prize for a transcription of one of Dickens's shorthand texts. And now this is a very generous offer and we hope it will be an incentive for the general public to get involved in the project. So if you're the kind of person like me who likes word puzzles and deciphering strange scripts and codes or doing crosswords, this could be for you. So we'll be explaining the prize in a bit more detail in the final session, which is all about deciphering. So please stay tuned for that. Now back to Claire to kick off the first session. Thanks so much, Hugo. I'm delighted to be chairing our first session, which focuses on contexts by introducing shorthand culture and the challenges of deciphering, as well as a range of fascinating shorthand material in various different collections. We're going to listen to three snapshot papers first, and then you'll have the opportunity to put your questions to Kelly, Tim and Hugo in a panel Q&A. I should also say that for reasons of time, I'm keeping my speaker introductions brief and I've asked our other chairs to do the same. But please do have a look at the full speaker biographies and find out more about all of the amazing work that these people are doing. So now to introduce our first speaker, Kelly McKay, a third year graduate student in the history department at Harvard University, whose research 
research focuses on the history of ideas of language in early modern England. Her paper today is titled All the World Writes Shorthand, the proliferation of shorthand in 17th century England. Over to you, Kelly. Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute while I was sharing my screen. <laughs> Let me try to do that one more time. All right, is that coming up all right? Looks terrific, Kelly. Great, all right, well, I'll just dive right in then. Um, thank you for the, the quick introduction and the larger introduction to the project as a whole and for orchestrating this event and, and the project. It's all very, very exciting and I'm delighted to, to kick things off. I'll do my best in these 10 minutes to offer a rough overview of English shorthand in the first century or so of its existence. My aim today is to give you all a sense of early modern shorthand um, at its beginning and how it took off both in practice and in the public consciousness of 17th century England. Because as anyone who studies shorthand will very quickly discover, shorthand was an important and impactful part of the written culture in England and in America as well from the 17th century on. Not everyone in the 1600s could write in shorthand, but a lot of people could, and many who couldn't were nonetheless aware of its presence and aware of the special qualities and the advantages that shorthand was invented to provide. In the first century of its history, those advantages didn't just come down to speed, the ability to take down live dictation. They also included secrecy, spatial efficiency, and to a slightly lesser extent, universality. All of those features were big selling points of shorthand right from the start. And in fact, those selling points were marketed and sold even before a workable shorthand system had been invented. The first shorthand manual called Charactery was published in 1588 by a doctor named Timothy Bright. And it was granted a 15 year copyright or privilege from Elizabeth I. Two years later, a writing master named Peter Bales published a derivative system, which came out in a second edition seven years later, and which he revised yet again three years after that, uh, though this third book isn't really a shorthand manual properly defined. So in other words, 12 years into the 15 year patent, and already there are three more books in violation of that patent, and there would be more as well. This is an important lesson in the history of shorthand that as soon as a system is out there, it's as good as in the public domain and people will do whatever they want with it, whether that means adapting it to their own needs and preferences for private use or reprinting it under their own name with maybe some slight modifications or maybe no modifications at all. But before we get there, how did Bright and Bell systems work? What what were they essentially? Well, neither was especially practical. In fact, they were quite the opposite. With Bright, you essentially had to memorize 536 different ordered shapes that aligned with a list of as many words. With Bales, you again had a core vocabulary of 536 words, but you represented them with the first letter of the word and then a mark in one of 12 places around a central radius. So here are the first 24 words in both systems. Both have some immediate problems when you try to put them to work. They're very memory intensive and there's bail system in particular has very little meaningful distinction between words. So by way of example, I took the liberty of writing out one of his practice exercises in his shorthand. And this is what I ended up with at the, at the bottom of the page here. It was a total nightmare to write, but it is far, far more difficult to read because there's very little dif distinction between the placement of the dots around the central letters. So the big takeaway is that neither of these systems is really all that good. But what is interesting about both of them is that the concept of shorthand that they promised nevertheless captures the public imagination, even though the inventions themselves fell short. As early as 1589, just one year after Bright's manual was published, one starts to find mentions of shorthand in the prefaces to printed sermons. These texts claim to have been taken in shorthand by members of the audience, and it seems to be a way of validating the authenticity of the printed sermon. 
that they were supposedly transcribed means that what you're reading is as close to a live performance as you can get in a printed work. But as we can intuit from the systems themselves, this is a case where the printed discourse does not correspond to the actual progress of shorthand. Just because something says that it was taken down in shorthand doesn't mean that it actually was. And it's worth pointing out too, that except for very few novel specimens of Bright's character, scholars have yet to find any examples of either of these 16th century systems being used and never for live transcription. But in the 17th century, things start to change. We're still within that 15 year period of Bright's privilege, but in 1602, another manual comes out published anonymously, but written by John Willis. This marked a major departure from the first two systems, and it was really Willis who set forth the foundational principles of shorthand that would remain in place for the rest of the century and beyond into Dickens's lifetime. It's no exaggeration to say that every 17th century shorthand system was either directly or indirectly indebted to Willis, and there were many. There were over 150 distinct shorthand manuals printed between 1588 and 1700, written by over 30 different authors, some of whom developed and published multiple systems over their careers. And I should note that what you're looking at right now is, um, is showing what we know to have existed, but there's reason to believe there's actually a lot more in terms of shorthand manuals, particularly in those early decades. As I mentioned before, these authors, and in some case publishers, exhibited no compunction with publishing minimally adapted versions of other people's work, though it must be said that every author was ready and able to explain why their own system was the best. All of these systems worked in a completely different way from Bright's and Bale's. You are released from the burden of memorizing random signs or dot positions, and instead all you had to memorize was a new alphabet, which could be strung together to phonetically represent words. This was meant to be faster um, and more spatially efficient than longhand, because if you're only writing down the phonetically salient bits of words, then you're leaving out all of the extraneous letters that English orthography has inbuilt. There were also ways of um, signaling vowels that didn't require writing anything down. Um, and there were a lot of other abbreviation options too. You could render common words by their first letter, leave out grammatically intuitive information like articles or verb endings, and you could use ideographs and other such things to represent visualizable concepts like sun or heart. And you could adapt those in productive ways as well. So right now, for example, I'm deciphering a, a system of shorthand um, that uses the sign for sun very productively. And the word reason, for example, is written R and then the little ideograph for sun. So in sum, shorthand was a rich and adaptable system that basically had no orthography. There was no right way of writing it as long as at the end of the day, you could read what you'd written down. Which leads to the all important question, how do we interpret it now? How do we as modern historians or just interested people identify and decipher and derive meaningful information from the shorthand evidence that exists? I've offered a narrative today that's based primarily on printed evidence and particularly on shorthand manuals, printed texts designed to teach you how to write in shorthand. And from those manuals, we can see a pattern of prevalence and growth. I've hinted at another narrative, which is based not on the manuals, but on how the phenomenon of shorthand works its way into a larger published discourse. This begins with the sermons that purport to have been taken in shorthand, and it continues through the 17th century as better systems are published and people do actually start to use shorthand in an active and professional capacity. By looking at these materials, we see a similar story of growth. From the early 17th century, shorthand starts to be mentioned both positively and negatively, and also metaphorically in the theological texts, natural philosophy, pedagogical treatises, political and legal tracts, as well as in dialogue and plays. Shorthand, along with its many synonyms, character, brachigraphy, tachigraphy, stenography, et cetera, et cetera, develops an understandable association with abridgment, which some people tend to view positively, that it allows you to get to the essence of a text, while others view pretty negatively, that it's stripping all the meat and meaning away from the text. 
So there are a lot of complicated dimensions to how shorthand is talked about. And as I talked about earlier, sometimes these sources are really not to be trusted and need to be read with a knowledge of what shorthand actually is and how it actually works. Just to, to close, the, these two narratives, the one based on the manuals and, and the other based on printed discourse, flesh each other out, I think, and, and offer a, a fairly adequate overview for now. But if we're to really establish a full history of early modern shorthand or shorthand more generally, we really need projects like this that are focused not on supplementary materials, although those supplementary materials are much easier to read, but that take into account shorthand itself in practice. This, of course, poses a whole host of challenges, but as I hope my more general narrative has shown, it's very much worth the effort. Shorthand is not some fringe writing system. Its basic functions were common knowledge and therefore should be common knowledge to us today as we look back and consider written culture um, throughout early modern and modern history. So I'll leave it there and um, thank you all for your attention. Kelly, thank you so much. Just like a great shorthand system, I feel you have risen to the challenges of compression while giving us an incredibly rich paper in, in that overview. Thank you. So I'd now like to move to our next speaker and introduce Tim Underhill from Cambridge, who wrote a PhD on the stenographer John Byram, and who has a wonderful range of shorthand projects currently underway, including a new biography and edition of Byram, and a catalogue of Samuel Pepys shorthand collections. Given our theme for this panel, Shorthand Mysteries, I was delighted to see that he's given his title in the form of a riddle, four, two, three, five, four, five, or very merry guessing words. Tim's paper is pre-recorded, but he'll be joining us in the Q&A. Here we go. Four, two, three, five, four, five. No, that's not my contact phone number. It's a little puzzle someone gave the stenographer, poet and religious seeker, John Byram in 1735. Byram boasted, if he knew just the number of letters for each word in a sentence, he could work it out. And he did. Can you? The solution's coming up later. This challenge happened during a convivial tavern evening where half of the 14 men round the table knew Byram's shorthand. And for me, it encapsulates something I hope it's useful to highlight today, recovering a sociability in deciphering. Byram developed his shorthand in the late 1710s, fine tuning it over the next 30 years, but it didn't get into print until after his death in this 1767 manual. In his lifetime, he'd aimed it particularly at young lawyers and undergraduates who paid a princely five guineas to learn it, either from him personally or one of his loyal network of teachers. So far, I've traced over 300 men and women and a few children who knew it while still unpublished, from the highly eminent to the completely obscure. What we might call this scribal community deployed shorthand for numerous purposes like capturing trials, lectures, verses, sermons and conversations, and to transcribe, annotate, interlineate, draft, dock it, commonplace, diarise, and even carve into stone. Dickens scholars shouldn't see Byram as merely antiquated prehistory to what Dickens learned, but rather as a living context. By the 19th century, it was more widespread than ever it was in its inventor's lifetime, particularly in adapted forms, and you could get personal tuition in it in the Lincoln's Inn area in the 1830s. I think the reasons why a system like the Gurney system version Dickens knew supplanted it 
had less to do with intrinsic technical reasons than external factors like patronage and influence. The fact that, unlike Gurney, Byram wasn't able to make his system an official vehicle for institutional memory. Here are three quick 18th century examples. Because this is a symposium to do with Dickens, I thought I'd better start with a novel. Here's a transcription of Smollett, which one Leonard Walker copied out in Manchester in 1764 for his friend Joseph Caldwell, probably designed as an aid to learning. The second two are courtesy of the John Rylands Library. First, a lovely example of shorthand cut into paper by Byram's sister Phoebe. And earlier this year, John Rylands acquired an important manuscript by one of Byram's most famous pupils, Charles Wesley, who, like his brother John, was a skilled user of Byram's shorthand throughout his life. There's still important research to be done on hymn versions like the ones here. We tend to think of shorthand as an interim, discardable, ephemeral, sometimes secretive medium, expecting a rough or hurried ductus in the writing. So examples like these might seem um, surprising, but they're not untypical. This is shorthand that's intended to be read and reread by people besides the original writer. And I hope they highlight there's more to shorthand than mere semantic content and give a sense of what Byron constantly promoted as his system's beauty, arising from the regularity and underlying geometric conception of the symbols, which he contrasted with what he called the awkward, ugly, distorted figures of his rivals. Just as significant was his avoidance of arbitraries or symbolicals, the things that caused David Copperfield's heartbreaking experiences with his despotic characters. Learning Byram didn't require memorizing countless lists of shapes, such as, to quote poor David, the beginning of a cobweb, meaning expectation, or a pen and ink skyrocket, standing for disadvantageous. It's easier to learn, use and read than a system like Gurney's. But that's not to say it never poses difficulties or puzzles. Far from it. Byron was something of a pioneer of the shorthand correspondence course, and one of the first letters by him I ever deciphered was written to a recent initiate in his shorthand fraternity. It ends with this formidable sign-off, which caused me real headaches to unravel. I'd also been stumped by a similarly baffling amalgamation of consonants coming earlier. With hindsight, contextual clues meant this one should have been easier to work out, but again, I was foxed. So to then come to the brackets immediately afterwards was almost to experience Byram addressing me directly. That bit in brackets, the, the bit underlined in red says, if you cannot read this, as the man said, give it to your neighbors. Reassuringly to his novice pupil, Byram's highlighting that he's using more advanced techniques of contraction of a phrase, not a single word here. It's to be expected it will seem difficult at first. In the act of deciphering, I was that novice, deliberating slowly over the shapes, wondering if a dotting or positioning was significant or irrelevant. I realised what was going on when I'd finally unravelled contraction rules number seven and number 14 from Byram's printed manual. But a manual is a very poor substitute for the shorthand writing neighbours we know his pupil had when he got that letter. And I don't think anyone's made great strides learning shorthand with a manual alone, especially if they're not simultaneously learning to write to others in it. As I suggested at the start, Byram's shorthand was informed by 18th century associational culture, something glimpsed in coterie verse like this. He organised several informal clubs for his pupils to foster mutual improvement in writing. The Cambridge Club, for example, went on a fieldwork trip to Trinity Chapel's organ gallery to hone their stenography skills on sermons. And at the Hoop Inn, round the corner in Bridge Street, perhaps behind one of these windows, in fact, the company were very merry guessing words. 
We know these only from an 1850s longhand transcript of Byram's lost shorthand original. You have to write those words back into shorthand to see why they might be fun to work out. In the same way, you won't quite get the jokiness behind that beg leave to call myself your most obedient humble servant to command sign off unless you see and trace out that shorthand on the page for yourself. My wider point here is about the shortcomings of using transcription alone. Once shorthand turns into longhand print, a sometimes dangerous fixture takes place, especially if the actual shorthand gets forgotten. Classic example is Robert Latham and William Matthews edition of Pepys. They were quite upfront about the tentative nature of much of their transcription, but their edition is invariably quoted as definitive and also as if it's the longhand transcript that Pepys actually wrote. Which brings me to the solution to that challenge at the start. The solution is, what do you think this means? I say the solution because that's what Byram told us it was. But perhaps a solution would be apter. So often with shorthand deciphering, we have multiple possible solutions to weigh up. Future work on them requires building collaborative, sociable approaches if we're to make deeper inroads, not just into deciphering, but more fully exploring shorthand's important place in linguistic and cultural history. That's why I'm excited that the Dickens Code project could foster new ways to reinvigorate interest in obsolete shorthands. Digitalization and machine learning are bringing many advances to areas of paleography and code ecology to assist academics in all this. But on a simpler mundane level, don't let's forget a lot begins with the simple pleasures and rewards of collaborative puzzle solving. If you cannot read this, as the man said, give it to your neighbours. Which brings me nicely to another puzzle to do with another fast disappearing media form, postcards. Using shorthand or abbreviations or codes on postcards in the early 20th century was hugely popular. Here's one I've got from 1903 that shows Dickens' birthplace. You might make out that it's got some Pittman shorthand on the back. Perhaps the roots of this started over 150 years before. For example, one of Byram's rivals, a stenographer called Orley Macaulay wrote in the 1750s how using his polygraphy system, gentlemen and ladies may in the size of a card communicate their thoughts to each other in a very extensive manner. Claire, Hugo and I thought it might be great to encourage some shorthand deciphering via the Dickens Code website by posting up a few examples of cards from a little collection of such things I've assembled over the years. And I hope some of you out there might help us with their solutions and enjoy solving them too. Thanks very much for listening. And I'm really sorry I can't actually be present at the symposium today, but please feel free to get in touch with me if you've got any questions. But of course, we are fortunate that Tim is in fact here with us today and will be joining the Q&A shortly. Thank you, Virtual Tim, for your paper. I feel it could almost be an unofficial motto for us on the Dickens Code project. Um, if you cannot read this, give it to your neighbour. But now to our third speaker and my co-I on the Dickens Code project, Hugo Bowles, Professor of English at the University of Foggia. Hugo has written an absolutely pioneering study of Dickens' shorthand, Dickens and the Stenographic Mind, published by Oxford University Press in 2019. His paper today is evocatively titled The Devil's Handwriting, Dickens, Recography and Two Mysteries. Thank you, Claire. Um, I've got quite a lot to get through in 15 minutes, so I'm going to go straight into this. Um, if I go too quickly, um, apologies, and please let me know uh, in the chat um, what the problem is and what the question, and we can catch up in the Q&A at the end. Okay, off we go. Um, just a bit of background to start off with. Um, Dickens uh, left school 
um, he was born in 1812 and he left school at the age of 16. He had a rather erratic schooling. And at the age of 16, he decided to learn shorthand. Um, and he learned it from uh, one of the manuals that, that Kelly, um, Kelly talked about a lot of manuals. Um, it was a manual called Brachygraphy, which was invented by Thomas Gurney in the 18th century. Um, so it had been around for about a hundred years. You can see it in the plate on the, the rather nice plate on the left. Um, and he learnt, he learnt it because he wanted to become a shorthand reporter, which he of course later did in 1829. It took him about, I don't know, maybe six months to a year to learn it. And he then became a shorthand reporter in the courts in London, mostly the ecclesiastical courts at Doctors' Commons. And thereafter, um, he would have used shorthand, I think, as, a, as part of his writer's toolkit. He was, it was a daily uh, practice. He would have used it, obviously, for his journalism in the early years, for copying things down, for writing drafts and letters, for writing notes to himself. And um, so we only have 12 surviving manuscripts, but some of these are undeciphered. And these are the texts that we really we need to concentrate on uh, in our project. And one, he found it very difficult, of course, he called it a sea of perplexity, and we're going to be looking very quickly at why that was. But one thing I, I want to just talk about very quickly is that Dickens, an, an, under, sort of an underestimated side of Dickens is that he was a, also a, a part-time shorthand teacher. And looking at that um, a little bit more, he taught shorthand that we know to three people. One was his brother-in-law in, in, in the 1830s, uh, another pupil was Arthur Stone, the son of his neighbour in 1859, so towards the end of his life, and he taught it to his son um, Henry in the 1860s in rather comical fashion. Um, and what we learn from his teaching is actually the way that Dickens, we learn about how he learned it as well as how he taught it. Um, and the learning involved uh, some of the things that Kelly was talking about before, it involves a lot of memorization of symbols and it also involved dictation practice because you have to memorize symbols and then you had to practice them and so how do you practice well the best thing is to do is to get someone to talk to you and you have to write down what they say and you can see this um, in the illustration on the left which is from Dick David Copperfield and here we see David's friend Traddles improvising a speech in the parlor to Mr Dick and Betsy Trotwood and the cat um, sitting there and David on the left in the corner writing down uh, his shorthand his shorthand notes of the speech. Um, and this is what Tim was calling the social side of shorthand and it's something which we have to recover. Um, and this you can see this is the part of David Copperfield because the chapter 38 of David Copperfield is where Dickens describes his learning of shorthand but it becomes a kind of an extended rant about how difficult it was um, and this was the only part of it that he really enjoyed. So this is quite important. Um, and the other interesting thing we've got is we've got five undeciphered dictation exercises, which he did with Arthur Stone in 1859. And we'll be looking at these later on um, in the session at three o'clock from the Joe Shentoff from the Free Library of Philadelphia. We'll be, we'll be looking at those. So that's very interesting. These are very interesting texts. And he also had a shorthand notebook, um, which is in the John Rylands Library in Manchester. And we'll be hearing about that later on. Here's a little example of what the notebook would look like. You can see on the left there the symbols in his blue ink and what the symbols referred to on the right. So that's really to do with his teaching, which is actually becomes very important when we have to decipher his shorthand. So why was it so hard? And Dickens called it a savage stenographic mystery. Um, why was it savage? What was savage about it? When Kelly has mentioned a few of the things and Tim also, um, the first thing is that the amount you had to memorize, you had 24 symbols which corresponded to consonant letters. You can see these down here on the left. So on the left column, you've got the symbol and next to it is the letter. So you, there are 24 of those. Then you had what are called the arbitrary characters, the arbitraries, which Byron, Tim was mentioning, didn't have. And he was quite right not to have them because they are a complete waste of time. But there are 74 of them which le the learners were forced to learn. On the right, you've got, um, in the right hand page, you can see there are sort of grammatical words, suffixes, prefixes and so on. And then on the left hand page, you've just got a lot of legal words which, which aren't really particularly useful. So that was the part which was 
are really not, not a very important part, but they were forced to memorize and very difficult it was too. If you think that we only have 26 letters of our alphabet and here you've got 98 to memorize. And we can see how the system works if we look at our pre-symposium task. Now, um, Claire and I set you a little task to do if some of you have done it. It was to, um, we gave you these two strings of symbols and asked you to find a Dickens novel, uh, construct a Dickens novel out of these symbols. So let's go through this really quickly. Uh, if we look at the one on the left, you can see the first symbol is this uh, upside down, this sort of semicircle. And if you find the symbol for that, and there it is an L, the second one is uh, just a vertical line, and that one is a T. Then you go back to the, um, the, the semicircle, and you've got an L. Then you've got an oblique line like that, which is a D. Then you've got another symbol there, which is an R. And then you've got the vertical line again, which is a T. And there you've got L, T, L, D, R, T. And you can all of you see now that what we've got here is Little Dorrit. So well done, all of you, for getting that right, because I'm sure you did. The second one on the right, here we've got an L, uh, an L shape, which obviously isn't an L, um, and this is an H. Then we've got the same syllable, often the same syllables keep the same syllables, the same symbols keep coming up time and again. This one is the R. Then we've got the oblique line again, which is the D. Then we've got the vertical line again, which is the T, and then we've got a backward C, which is a new, new one here, and that's an M. And then we've got an oblique line going to the right, which is uh, an S, which is used for plurals a lot of the time. And as you can see, as most of you, I'm sure, got right, we have hard times. So you can see how the system works. This is, these were very simple, straightforward examples. You get, this, you get the consonants, and then you have to fill in the blanks. But it was the filling in of the blanks that was the problem, because the blanks are vowels, and vowels in the system are optional. Um, and Gurney himself says, it will be observed that in the spelling of words, no particular regard is had either to the retaining or omitting of vowels. So he says, well, you can put them in if you want, or you don't have to put them in, so it's all a bit pointless. Um, and how do you do that? How do you mark a vowel? You mark a vowel with a space. As Kelly was saying, you could use a space between the symbols to indicate a vowel. And to show you how this was done, I'm going to take an example that Dickens himself gives us in his dictation exercises, which is this. This is Dickens's version of the word talent. And this one here is Arthur's version. Now, when you look at that, you think, oh, they look different. But they actually, these represent the same word. And the only difference is that Dickens has got a space uh, between the first symbol and the rest of the the rest of the character and Arthur hasn't he's joined everything up so Dickens is T space LNT and Arthur's is TLNT now this isn't a problem to get talent from this but it's just to show you that um, a writer uh, who puts a space in is a better writer it means that they put the space in so it's easier to read that off the page so we all hope that that shorthand gurney writers will, will leave a space like Dickens did because it makes it easier to read, though it is harder to write like this because you've got to take your pencil off the page. So you're wasting a bit of time. And if you haven't got time, if you're fr a frazzled no novice like Arthur was, a pupil, you tend to join things up. And so Arthur did join things up, no spaces. So it's easier to write because you're not taking a pencil off the page, but it's really hard to read when you haven't got this, the vowel spaces. And Dickens tells this actually to Arthur in his notebook, in his Arthur's notebooks. He says to Arthur, Arthur, express vowels a little more. What he means by that, he's saying, Arthur, put your spaces in. Take your pencil off the page, put the vowels in, because then we'll understand what you've written a little bit better. OK, so that's really the problem with vowels. So that's the first mystery. OK, the difficulty of the system, the savagery of Gurney. But there's even worse things to come, which is that there's, a, there's an additional second mystery, which is the fact that Dickens made up his own private system. And he did this in a number of ways. Um, and this is our problem. This is our real problem. First of all, he invents new symbols. And this is quite fun. Um, they're quite nice, some of them. This one here is a, from his notebook. He does three parallel horizontal lines there to, for electric telegraph because obviously Gurney doesn't have a symbol for electric telegraph because it was the 18th century. But Dickens thought, let's have one. So he puts one in. 
But of course, it's completely pointless because how many people are going to use the word electric telegraph when they're in parliament in law courts? Hardly anyone. So this whole business about having arbitrary characters like this is all wasting everybody's time. But this is a much more useful one. This is one that Dickens um, invented from his symbol for about, which looks very similar, but he changed it and put a little squiggle in the center and turned it into round. So you've got the symbol for R in the center of the squiggle and then the, the whirly bit becomes round. So it kind of, it's iconographic. It looks like what it is. And in one of Dickens's shorthand letters, you can see him using it there. So that's an example of a useless, a useless arbitrary character electric telegraph and a really useful one called round. Then he did things like invent combinations. Now combinations are little, are invented symbols which stand for lots of things at the same time. So here you've got an L and a B stuck together and it can mean lab, leb, lib, lub and lob and so on. So that's quite a useful kind of shorthand of shorthand as it were. He's, he's abbreviated the system uh, himself. He's found a shortcut if you like. A shortcut of shorthand is what he does and it really makes it impossible for us to, to work out what he's doing. And the last thing, which is worst of all, is he changes the standard script of characters. He changes the shape. So his writing changes, a bit like the way our handwriting changes. We get, you know, we, the, the faster we write, the older we get, the more illegible our handwriting becomes. And with Dickens, it was a bit like that. And I want to give you an example. This is, I'm getting to the close now. We gave you this symbol here as a pre-symposium task. And this is a really difficult one. The context of it was I blank blank character two. So it's I want to, I need to, I have to, something like that goes in there. It's going to be a verb, but that's all we can say. So what does it stand for? Now, that the experts in the 19th century, including William Carlton, the great Dickens scholar and great stenographer, thought it was a mixture of these symbols, the P symbol, the R symbol, the S symbol, uh, and the M symbol, but they couldn't agree on anything. They agreed only on the beginning, so they're all looking at this character, and the first stenographer, who I think was Carlton, they all agreed on the first symbol, which stood for them PR. Now this is maddening. This is the, thing, the kind of thing that drives you insane, because look at the P, Okay, that's a pointed hat. I look at that and I see a pointed hat, don't you? Then look at the P in the Gurney system. It's a semicircle, isn't it? So how did they know that that was a P? And the answer, the only reason they knew is that they were really good stenographers and they, they had looked at a lot of Dickens' stenography and worked out that this was a P. And that's the kind of stuff that we have to re recover because it's the only way we're going to be able to transcribe. We've got to start looking at it really carefully and working out what on earth these things stand for. And then of course they go on and they disagree. We've got PRM for the next bit, PRS for this person, and this stenographer said PRP. And then the first stenographer did the last little bit of the symbol PRMS, the second one said it was PRSM, and the third one said it was PRPS. But of course you get three different verbs now out of this. The first one says, I, what do you think that is? PRMS becomes, I promise to. The second one, PRSM becomes, I presume to. And the third one becomes, I PRPS, I propose to. And any of these is perfectly good. They fit, they're syntactically possible. So, you know, take your pick. I haven't got a clue how to answer this one. Sorry, everyone. That's why I put the character in there for you. But it's the kind of difficult problem that we're faced with. But not all of it is like that, I, I'm, I'm glad to say. Okay, so that's it. And the, the thing is that that is the problem. The problem I, that it was identified by Dickens himself, he says, the tremendous effects of a curve in the wrong place have not only troubled my waking hours, but reappeared before me in my sleep. Now that was him talking about Gurney, but it's also us talking about him, okay? Because these are curves in the wrong place. So we have got, he's given us the same, an extra problem. We've got not only got to understand Gurney, we've, we've got to understand him too. So we've got a sort of doubly savage problem ahead of us. And 
Um, how do we cope with this? What are we going to do? We've, going, we've got to do what Kelly and Tim, especially Tim, I think here was talking about. We have to become sociable and recover the social side which Dickens enjoyed and which Byron's followers enjoyed. Um, so we have to work out the details of Dickens's private system by a new socialization or a new sociability for shorthand. So please everybody join in and uh, we can be merry guessing our words. Thank you very much. Back to Claire. Terrific. Thank you so much, Hugo. And I'm so pleased as well that you focused on the joy at the end there because it was sounding very, very, very difficult. Well, it, isn't. it is and it isn't. But that's that's part of the fun. I mean, you can have fun looking at difficult things. So we've got 10 minutes now for our Q&A. Please do pop your questions into um, the Q&A function there. We can also have you asking questions on mic. If you find that easier, just raise your hand. And I think while people are mulling over what they want to ask, perhaps I could start with a question in particular for Tim and Kelly. You mentioned that you've been doing a bit of well, you do quite a lot of decoding. And I wondered if you had any tips, how can you really get started? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start off, Tim? <laughs> how do you start? <laughs> Where to begin? Um, patience is all, context is all. I think you've got to establish the context of a document. Um, uh, it's that. I think my other, I mean, it's just a very general, probably uh, obvious tip, and it would apply to any um, paleographical study, really, is you just leave gaps that you can't work out and you come back to them. You can't hope to do things sequentially. Um, insights strike you at different times when things are difficult. So you work up a transcription rather than um, sort of approaching it sequentially. But that's that's perhaps that's obvious. Perhaps that's not what you were after. I think also the, the other point I would make is don't trust manuals necessarily. Um, when I for this is a, a point I will make, and I'm sorry because Kelly, when we've chatted, I've probably <laughs> said this to you so many times um, uh, that I I feel my my research when I started doing this was very pre digital. Um, I was transcribing things from archives on filing cards with pencil. I couldn't get images of this. Mm. I couldn't afford to take them. There was a different culture within, um, within libraries of librarians guarding their materials, not wanting copies to be made. So I had to work by working on my own inadequately copied out transcriptions of manuscripts and then go back to the manuscripts. Now that has huge disadvantages, but the advantage was that it actually made me use the shorthand actually from the start. I was actually writing it. And I think sometimes people are setting out with something and never really quite using it. So that again would be another tip, copy it out, see what is significant, are those positions of curves really such a problem or not? Is that dot really so significant or not? So there we go, but uh, sorry, I don't know. Kelly, you've probably got some. Um... No, I, I agree with everything you just said. Um, I, I find writing it out yourself to be a pretty crucial step also because in the process of deciphering, you're also learning and you're training yourself to recognize patterns. And that's not just a visual thing. That's also a, like with any paleographic challenge, I think I find it very helpful. Um, I, I'm not sure that I agree with the, with the manual point that you made just because I find that it can be easy to have some sort of place to begin. So whether that is maybe you're lucky and the manuscript that you're deciphering yes. has, a, has a key, use the key, use everything that you can. Um, and I have, I'm not quite as good a decipher as Tim. I've, I've constrained myself to things that I, I feel that I have enough inbuilt infrastructure that it's possible. <laughs> there was one moment when I thought I'd be able to decipher a whole book and I it was it was just too daunting of a task. I, I figured out one psalm because it was labeled as psalm and I guessed it was the first one and that sort of helped um help to piece things together. So in that case I had a tool. I, I knew what it should say or I guessed what it should say. Um, 
Can I, say, can I say one little thing also? I think one really key thing is to share. If you if you if you get you've got to share everything around. If you get stuck, it's so much better to have someone else to, to say, look, you send them say, what do you think this is? This is what William Carlton did with his phones. Mm. It was always sort of they were writing letters. It was obviously taking quite a long time, but that's what they do. And I think you you make instead of worrying on your own. I think it's when things get. Um, too difficult it's you just talk to people and, and you find a way I think. totally agree totally agree and of course shorthand mattered to Carlton in a way that perhaps until now it hasn't mattered to to our generations mm. um more recently you know Carlton is an active stenographer they're still looking in Carlton's time for the best possible system Pittman is challenged by people surrounding Carlton. It's a vital concern for recording matters of moment in a way that perhaps it is, it's, uh, is no, lo no longer is. Um, I think that far too much of my earlier work was done in isolation. And even now I'm hardly getting other pairs of eyes on it in the way that I would be doing with group paleographical transcription work mm. that's on online platforms. Maybe that's a, a topic for later. But um, yes, always show people because diff as your um, example showed, Hugo, there are so many different possible readings. And I think that to have sometimes a notion of a definitive text can be a problem too. Yeah. You can only come up with something that might be a best fit or might be very tentative. And it's the accepting of that that is... Uh, Crucial. I'm going to move us on here because the questions are pouring in and I may ask uh, some of our panel here to answer these questions by typing if we can't get through them all. But first I've got one question um, that Maylene would like to ask on a microphone. So if you want to unmute yourself now you should be able to and ask away. Hello, thank you so much for, for three wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, I have a a comment on uh, on the last one and, and the great term um, social stenography or social shorthand, uh, which I think was is actually a, a great term. Um, I just want to share an experience from from working with a shorthand project uh, where we used crowdsourcing uh, a group of experts. And uh, um, they actually came up with, <laughs> with their own solutions to exactly those problems that you um, um, described here, especially with um, a, a personal handwriting, personal abbreviations, uh, and a system that, or a, a writer that doesn't typically follow the, <laughs> the system. And what they did was that they started to collect variations of um, of a vocabulary. So every time uh, my author, which is a Swedish author called Astrid Lindgren, uh, every time she wrote uh, the word or the sequence uh, that was common, they just collected all those examples. Um, and then they could actually um, <laughs> uh, do this sort of collaboration with our handwritten text recognition expert that we have in our project who's doing the digital um, aspect. So she could use this sort of encyclopedia of variations to, to make a semi-automatic um, uh, um, transcription. So she, she could actually sort of use the crowdsourcing and their ideas and work them into her digital um, development. So that was actually great. And they came up with that. Well, that sounds really interesting. I mean, Malin um, is, is running a very interesting project, which is very similar to ours. I mean, it's ex extraordinarily similar. Mm. Um, do you want to say something about it, Malin, while you're here? I can just say that your uh, early research on, on Dickens was a great inspiration for, for our project on Swedish author Astrid Lindgren, who is most famous, I think, for Pippa Longstocking in the English speaking world. And she wrote all her books in shorthand and nothing has been interpreted or uh, or decoded before. So we're looking at 670 notepads and 60 years of literary production wow. and we've just started. <laughs> hmm. Fantastic. Put a link to that project as well in, in the chat for us. I'm sure people here will be, be interested to find out more. Mm -hmm. 
So we've got too many questions here than we'll be able to answer in the time that we have remaining. But one final one, I think this is for Hugo here. Any examples that quickly come to your mind where Dickens's system, including his kind of private uh, adaptation of the system, fails due to the presence of foreign underlying characters or words? Have you come across anything like that, Hugo? Foreign underlying characters or words? I don't think I have yet, no. Um, the, the, the problem is that we haven't, it's very hard to, when you're, dis, when you're looking at the dictation exercises, which are the ones I've, I'm, I'm looking at, um, they are really, really difficult to do. So I, I only managed to decipher one because I found the source text of it. So mm. then you can match it all up. And it's when you find the source text. So I think what, what's, but when you match it up, it actually looks okay. When you match up, you'd think, oh yeah, that was, of course that was that and that was that. And then you look for irregularities. So um, I don't think it's, the thing, the problem is it doesn't, it fails for us, but it didn't fail for him. Mm. He used it successfully. And um, so I don't kind of think of it as failing. I think of it as just, it's, we have to work out how he used it and that's it really. Um, and the difficulty is, is, you know, like the one I showed you in the previous slide. Anyway, thanks for the question. It's a good question. And I'll keep a lookout for it. Yes, thank you so much, Marco. And thank you also to Keen and Ruben who have posed questions as well as uh, other people who've asked questions which have been answered. I'm going to ask my speakers to respond by typing their answers to these questions so that we can move on into the next panel. But not without saying a huge thank you again to Hugo, Tim and Kelly for getting us off to such a terrific start. If we were all in person, I'm sure you would be hearing thunderous applause now as we draw this first panel to a close. Thank you, all of you.